Hi right, guys. It is a stormy, rainy day here. And the collapse of global industrial civilization here uh, at Bugs in a Jar Farm in the Finger Lakes of New York where we are narrowly escaping. Once again, we are dodging the bullet. Is this the third or the fourth hurricane to threaten New York uh, here in the past three weeks or so? Kind of ironic that uh, I came here from Florida to New York. You know, my place in Florida has not had like one drop of rain from a hurricane in the summer of 2021. Anyway, trying to uh, enjoy the sick, twisted irony of that, but it is September 1st. It is Wednesday, September 1st, 2021. We are two-thirds of the way through 2021, and uh, anyway, so what is the state of the planet here on September 1st? Well, we are going to go over to, I keep coming back to what I'm quickly considering to be one of the best chroniclers of the collapse on the planet <clears throat> would be oilprice.com. I have been a fan of oilprice.com for years. You know, it is the most schizophrenic <clears throat> newsletter uh, out there. Uh, you know, it, it's geared towards uh, oil and gas investors mostly. It, it's totally geared to how to make money in the end time. So you've got to uh, kind of figure that into when you're listening to them. But we are going to let oilprice.com explain to us. Just nobody else is, I guess. The one and only way to, av to avoid a climate crisis, of course, there is no way to avoid a climate crisis. We're in a climate, anyway, you know what I'm saying. But we're going to get back to the one and only way to avoid a climate crisis. Uh, before we get into there, we're just going to go down the other Rolodex of stories in this week's oil price dot com uh, headlines. How about Nordic American tankers? More oil is coming to the market. The oil tanker industry faces brighter prospects in the coming months with more crude oil set to arrive on the international markets according to the North to the Nordic American tankers. Yes. Quoting the uh, second quarter update, quote, demand for oil is going up. OPEC is raising its output. Current high oil, gas, and electricity prices, even long before the winter has arrived, is a sign of an energy chain in need of more. Yes. Uh... <clears throat> Did you realize uh, the world will continue to need oil and has still not come up with a realistic alternative to this versatile and valuable raw material? Energy transitions take time and oil will be needed for decades to come. Do you think so? Uh, oh shit, uh, I'm having a problem, uh, with, uh, oh no, this is not good, my computer is eating a lot of these stories. How about all electric future comes at a huge cost? The electrification of homes is touted as one way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the residential sector. As the U.S. aims for a net zero economy by 2050, but going all electric will not be as easy as it seems. This electrify everything drive comes with higher upfront 
and in some cases higher maintenance cost for consumers, higher cost for home building contractors, and higher intangible cost for politicians who may prematurely call the end of gas furnaces and boilers and saddle voters with higher energy bills. In addition, all electric homes with electric vehicle charges are expected to raise peak power demand, which some electric grids cannot handle as is and would need billions of dollars from upgrades. Do you think so? Let's see. How about, man, this is not good, guys. Uh, my computer is telling me I, my computer does not have enough memory to open this page every time I try to, let's go, uh, let's try this again. We're going to, uh, let's see if we can get to this page. Here we go. Fujara oil terminal to upgrade as crude trade is expected to surge. Yes, the Fujara oil terminal is upgrading its infrastructure to link the storage site with a key crude pipeline and the terminal for super tankers at the point of Fujara, wherever that is, in order to meet an expected boom in crude oil. Yes. Uh, let's see what else have we got here before we get into the uh, only way to save the planet. Now, of course, you can expect this in an oil price.com, oil could be primed for up to 50% rally strategists say. The price of WTI crude oil could be headed for a jump of between 20% and 50%, judging from a bullish breakout pattern. That suggests a major rally could be coming. Yes. We are in the Golden Cross, whatever that means. How about next to that, oil stages strong recovery. Where is the oil price this week? This is oilprice.com. With fundamentals largely remaining the same as they were last week, oil prices nevertheless are poised to post sizable gains with global benchmark Brent tra now trading above $72 per barrel and WTI climbing just south of $69 per barrel. All right, so let's just touch, I'm just gonna read uh, just the headlines and the lead of, here's a few more stories before we get to the only way to save the planet. I love this one, uh, this could be its own rant, Congo seeks to review Chinese metal deals. The government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is reviewing its six billion dollar infrastructure for metals deal based on concerns that they are not sufficiently benefiting the Congo as China now controls 70% of DRC's mining sector, and I have to uh, do an entire rant about how the Chinese empire is uh, using the markets, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Basically, you know, instead of military takeover of countries, the Chinese empire is using the playbook of um, what was that John Perkins book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. 
how China is controlling you know huge majorities of the of these various countries resources and if they don't pay their debt China goes in and takes their resources this is true everywhere from Ecuador to the Democratic Republic of China it's how to make an empire without invading a company militarily is what this is all about but anyway, what else? Um, I bet uh, Venezuela's state oil company is offering international buyers 20 million barrels of heavy crude, yes, for between 35 and 41 dollars per barrel. Uh, there you go. Uh, India to boost uh, LNG import uh, potential. I think we talked about that uh, last uh, week. How about China's state-owned oil firm CNPC announces large oil shale find the discovery of a major oil, major shale oil field in the immediate vicinity of the Daqing oil field, uh, with expected reserves of up to 1.3 billion tons. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Rosneft wants to export pipeline gas. Yep, yep, yep. And who knows, right next to that, China wants more pipeline gas. So Russia wants to export pipeline gas. China wants more pipeline gas. China's CNPC will drill three new complex production wells at its super giant Galkanish gas field in Turkmenistan. Yes, in a deal that would see it receiving the produced gas as a means of payment for its drilling. Yes, amid soaring LNG prices, China has been ramping up its pipeline gas imports. What is going on with lithium? Europe's largest lithium project sparks anger. The $2.4 billion JDAR project of Anglo-Australian miner Rio Tinto has sparked controversy in Serbia as locals fear possible environmental damage from the mine. Um, the mine is assumed to become Europe's largest lithium mine, <coughs> aiming for <coughs> a peak production capacity <coughs> of 58,000 tons of lithium. I don't know, do they mean tons per day? or per year. Uh, all right. Let's see. South Africa wants more nuclear energy. Yes. Uh, and let's wind up in Australia before we head over to uh, <clears throat> An Australian environmental group is suing the country's second largest gas producer, Santos, arguing that its 2040 net zero commitment is, quote, deceptive. This marks the first ever case to challenge the validity of one's emissions objectives. <clears throat> Okay, with all that in the background, 
we're now going to uh, find out, and this was on Yahoo News today as well as on oilprice.com, the one and only way to avoid a climate crisis. The one and only way. This is an essay written by <clears throat> Osama Rizvi. Osama is an economic and global oil market analyst who brings in a holistic point of view connecting geopolitics, economy, and politics. So Osama is going to tell us the one and only way to avoid a climate crisis. And then he starts, uh, you know, he, as they often do, with the laundry list of just summing up the summer of 2021. Uh, good Lord, just going through all of the stuff we've been talking about in the summer of 2021, which I don't need to repeat here. Um, it is against this background that one must engage with the technology narratives that argues negative emissions technology will save us from the specter of a climate crisis while we continue to grow. This promise, however, is a false one. It is important to note that technology will play a pivotal role in the collective progress against climate change, but to focus solely on technology would be a mistake. There are multiple issues with technological solutions, including their commercial viability, their scalability, and their effectiveness. The following charts demonstrating the impact of carbon capture and storage technology puts this into perspective clearly reliance on CCS only is not a viable answer. The International Energy Agency's 2050 roadmap calls for a three to four times scale up in renewables per annum until 2030 as compared to 2020 and at the same time a 59 times scale up of carbon capture and storage every year this decade. When compared to the historical growth in both renewables and CCS, it is clear that these figures are incredibly unrealistic. Do you think so? It is a dangerous idea to use a technological will fix all approach to justify the pursuit of continuous growth. Instead, we need to start to wrestle with the idea of degrowth. According to the Absolute Impact 2021 report by Carbon Tracker Inst Initiative, at the current rate of emissions, i.e. somewhere around 41 and a half gigatons of CO2 per year, we only have 22 years left before we see global temperatures rise by 1.75 degrees, 22 years my kulo. That gives an idea as to how quickly the world needs to deal with its emissions problem. It means there is not enough time for the world to wait for new technology to solve the problem. It is at this point that degrowth becomes a very appealing idea. Yes, I'm sure oil uh, price investors will think that degrowth becomes a very appealing idea that policymakers should pursue. 
To begin with, <clears throat> degrowth involves rejecting the link between growth and improvement in the standard of living. This has to be countered, of course, by the fact that as the population grows, more energy will be consumed. Importantly, high energy civilizations may face the risk of decline due to limitless consumption of energy. This is a good point to segue into the argument that degrowth should begin in developed countries in order to allow the developing world to catch up. Why? It is well known that developed countries have used fossil fuels for centuries <coughs> to fuel their <coughs> industrialization and pave the way to where they are right now. First coal and then hydrocarbons played a momentous role in this journey. Today, not only have the detrimental effects of this growth been skewed toward the global south, but the discrepancy between per capita energy consumption is still shocking. Jason Hickel in his book, The Divide, highlights the fact that 83% of deaths due to climate change occurred in the lowest carbon emitting countries and of 588 billion tons of carbon emissions through 2017, 70% of those came from industrial economies. Another very interesting measure used its global footprint network, which we have talked about many times here, per capita ecological footprint where a negative number shows that they are in an ecological deficit with biocapacity being defined as less than what is being consumed. Each human, you know, to if we wanted Earth Overshoot Day to occur on December 31st instead of in July, each human can consume roughly 1.8 hectares of the planet per year. That's about five acres, about four and a half acres that uh, if we want Earth overshoot, that each human gets uh, about four and a half acres of land basically to feed, house, and energize. Okay. <clears throat> that is similar to what people in Ghana consume. So if everyone lived, uh, had the environmental footprint, not the carbon footprint, the entire and ecological footprint of your average person from Ghana, uh, maybe the planet could recover each year. But in most developed countries such as the U.S. and Canada, the number is a staggering eight hectares per person per year, so that is 20 acres that it takes 20 acres of land somewhere on the planet to support every single human in the U.S. So this is where, you know, when these clueless morons, we could put the whole population of this earth into the state of Texas, and everybody on the planet would get about one-eighth of an acre. You know, when all of these overpopulation deniers, this is one of their favorite memes, is stuff the and stuff eight billion people could fit easily in the state of Texas. Nowhere does it mention how to feed, clothe, house, and energize the eight billion people living in Texas.
no mention of that 20 acres per person, despite constituting only 10% of the global population, the U.S. and the European Union account for 23% of global emissions. And of course, China is more than the U.S., of course, and India is now number four. One can continue to highlight the discrepancies between not only the energy consumption, but also the carbon emissions of more developed and less developed nations. The fact is that for many developing countries, fossil fuels, and this of course, <clears throat> India, the number one, which, you know, we talked about this, India, uh, which will already the fourth biggest emitter. And if every, and if India reaches the U.S., <clears throat> uh, it would be, we would need like 25 planets. Uh, all right, the fact is that for many developing countries, namely India, Fossil fuels remain a key lifeline as their populations grow and don't forget amid their endeavors to improve their standard of living. At the same time, and as the recent report by APCC shows, we must cut global emissions there is an urgent need to strike a balance, to find purpose in being moderate, and to let go of the relentless pursuit of growth. And then uh, if you enjoyed that story, you might enjoy more oil is coming to the market. Oil could be prime for a 50% rally, oil terminal to upgrade as crude trade is expected to surge and oil stages strong recovery. But I know there is one more that I missed here. Okay, one more breath of reality. Uh, what is the one that I missed? It was, oh, the future of oil is offshore. One more from, one more reality check. <clears throat> Brazil and its tiny neighbors, Guyana and Suriname, have recently risen to prominence with major oil discoveries, despite what most would see as an unfavorable environment. The energy transition seems to be moving ahead at full speed, and oils and oil's days should be numbered, only they aren't. And the future of oil appears to be offshore. Brazil will come to account for one quarter of global offshore oil output by 2025, a recent report uh, by Global Data said. This would mean South America's largest country would be supplying some 1.3 million barrels per day of offshore oil to global markets. Yes, uh, South America could surpass North America's <laughs> offshore production by 2023. Yep, yep, yep. Anyway, back to reality. <clears throat> Oil's days should be numbered, only they aren't. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Anybody wanting to make money off the collapse of a planet needs to subscribe to oilprice.com
you saying bye to the folks? But with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up today's chronicle of the collapse and sit here and dodge this bullet of the latest hurricane. And I got to meet up with this fellow coming to uh, bid the job of uh, constructing a levee you know, digging out a flood channel and constructing a levee in my backyard in upstate New York as uh, I prepare for the never-ending uh, string of hurricanes slamming bugs in a jar farm in upstate New York. <clears throat> I suggest you get out there and raise your levees while you still can. Bye, guys. All right, Did you survive that?